Good evening. Uh, welcome to another episode of Thinkers 50 Dialogue, or Thinkers Dialogue, which I've been hosting for the last few uh, months, and it's absolutely been a delightful experience of learning from each of the experts. Uh, but today we have a very, very special guest, uh, if I may claim that uh, a friend as well, uh, for many, many years. Uh, he's been uh, somebody like a friend, philosopher, and guide uh, on all things called shared value. Uh, if I have one person I've learned from over the last few years uh, on aspects of philanthropy, how it has to be seen, how it has to be measured, how we can create impact, how business models have to be done, then it has to be Mark. So Mark, uh, you've, you've been such a stunning pillar uh, in my uh, what I call course towards learning, in my journey towards learning. Uh, thanks a lot for being there for so many years uh, well, and having uh, faith in me and done like whatever I was trying to do. But beyond that, uh, I, I think there's a huge uh, uh, thing that Mark has done. In fact, one, of course, he is uh, a part of the teaching faculty at the Harvard Business School. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I think like in his previous avatar, uh, Mark started something called as the FSG. Uh, of course, initially named as the Foundation Strategy Group, but it, later it ended up becoming FSG, which if, from my point of view is one of the finest uh, consulting firms from a philanthropy point of view, from shared value point of view. And of course, he created a community of sorts uh, called the Shared Value Initiative. And uh, Institute for Competitiveness as part of the Shared Value Initiative has done seminal pieces with Harvard Business Review. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, his journey with Harvard Business Review started in the 90s, but his biggest piece uh, from my, uh, I think has been creating Shared Value, which appeared exactly 10 years back. So, uh, January was the 10th year uh, thing. So this is also a source of celebration of the very important work uh, on creating shared value and what people are really talking about at this point in time. So Mark, uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, and uh, thanks for accepting my invite. Uh, Amit, it's my pleasure to see you again. And Amit, it's, it's my uh, pleasure to see you again. And it's a uh, wonderful to Thank you. So, Mark, we'll qu quickly dive into the conversation, you know, like uh, uh, the, the work that you've done on shared value, of course, the preceding factor or the preceding body of work that you did before that was philanthropy. Uh, and of course, you've done uh, pieces with Mike Porter uh, on philanthropy and its importance and competitive advantage. Uh, but I would just like to first understand your journey of how did you move from philanthropy to really creating that construct called the creating shared value uh, as an idea. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, more than 20 years ago, I started working with Mike Porter. Years ago, I started working with Mike Porter. The question of how the strategy make more effective philanthropy. But, and out of that, we started, as you said, Foundation Strategy Group. But along the way, companies began to come to us initially to ask us to help them with their philanthropy. And as we analyzed their impact on the world, we realized that the impact of the company's business on social and environmental issues was overwhelmingly greater than the impact of its philanthropy. And on top of that, we began to think about how important it was to the success of companies that they operate in a safe, equitable, uh, sustainable, community. And we realized that you can't have a successful business in a failing society. And so we began to focus not on the friction between business and society, which is what so many people focus on, but instead on the synergy and interdependence, how a healthy society depends on a strong economy and competitive businesses, and how successful, profitable, competitive businesses depend on social and environmental issues for their success. And there's really no greater example of this than what we're living through all over the world in the pandemic right now, because it has become so clear that without a healthy workforce and customer base, you can't run your business. And businesses can't succeed, in this case, without immense government subsidy, if there isn't this healthy consumer and workforce uh, for them to work with and sell to. And so that's what really led us to think about this interdependence and this idea of creating shared value, whereby you are creating an economic benefit for the company, a competitive advantage, 
by creating a positive social impact on a material, social, or environmental issue. So, you know, like, of course, you, you did talk about COVID and the pandemic, and pandemic has really raised a lot of questions, I mean, of course, and challenges for the whole idea of strategy and how corporates need to function. Uh, how, how do you think this, this whole idea of pandemic has really redefined the very idea of business? Because what you're saying is the importance of uh, great customers, importance of healthy employees is there. You can't ignore it. But I'm sure there are many, many other ways in which pandemic has changed and the way business needs to function. And your ideas can actually have a huge impact. Yes. Well, I, you know, I think the other clear dimension is the importance of the role of government uh, in a successful market economy. There is and, you know, has been a lot of Honor. claims that uh, companies don't need government, that government support or regulation distorts markets, that just leave companies free to do whatever they want and everything will be fine. The reality is capitalism can be tremendously powerful uh, in raising standards of living, in solving social and environmental problems, in contributing to a better life, but only if it is a capitalist market that is well regulated and supported by government. And so I think that this notion that, that business success depends on social and environmental conditions is clear, but also that companies need to work with government to create a, a functional market that benefits everyone. So Mark, that, that's a very powerful statement in terms of like how we need to work with the regulator or the government. Uh, so what you're really trying to say is that, of course, the, the larger idea of capitalism has always been seen uh, from a negative perspective, that it's just about exploitation, it's about uh, profitability. But what you're really saying here is that we have to go beyond that and start looking at things in a much more different light, uh, especially focusing on social and environmental issues. Uh, how do you think we can bring that thinking to the fore? Because I think your, your ideas have been there in the world for the last 10 years, but I think it is still very early days. There is so much change that is required for improving uh, the state of being. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the change is hard because uh, we are uh, trying to overcome a deeply embedded point of view that says that if you're trying to do something good in the world, you do it through government or civil society and NGOs. And you don't worry about whether it makes any money. And if you're trying to make money in the world, you do that through a for-profit business, and you don't worry about the social or environmental impacts that that business may cause. And we are trying to turn that thinking upside down and say, actually, if you want to solve the world's biggest problems, it's only corporations that really have the scale and the expertise and the resources to make a difference at the level of impact we need to really change conditions on this planet. After all, if you think about the 100 largest economic entities in the world, more than two thirds of them are companies, not governments. And so the role that companies play in solving social problems, we believe is essential, not just by holding them back from uh, polluting or from making harmful products, but by actually finding ways to make money in solving social problems and advancing the SDGs. And so you're right, it's still early days uh, because that mindset shift that says companies can be agents of social progress and in fact need to be, that companies need to think about social and environmental impact as part of their core strategy, not as something that is peripheral and just there for the sake of improving their reputation or their license to operate. These are very profound changes that, frankly, go against a lot of what people learned in business school and a lot of what people experienced in their careers. And so making that shift is hard. I would say the key to making that shift is finding more and more examples of companies that are succeeding through their positive social impact, that do have uh, tremendous innovation 
Uh, and of course, uh, you know, one of the most obvious examples at the moment is Tesla, the electric car company. You know, every major car company back in the 1980s, 40 years ago, was experimenting with electric cars. And they all decided it wasn't viable and consumers didn't want it. And they all killed their research. And when Tesla started, not a single, single major car company was thinking at all about electric cars, and they thought Tesla was a joke. But inspired by the desire to reduce carbon emissions to help fight climate change, uh, Elon Musk you know, took on this extraordinary venture. And the result is not just that they have been immensely successful and made him billions of dollars, but it's changed the entire industry so that every major car company in the world now is either committed to or seriously considering shifting to electric cars. You could never have done that through a nonprofit organization. If Tesla, if, if Elon Musk had started a nonprofit to promote electric cars, it would have had no impact on the industry. Even if it was successful, it would have been dismissed. And it took a uh, billion dollars of capital to begin to create the, the enterprise to make the cars before they went public. And again, if it was a nonprofit civil society organization, they never could have accessed a billion dollars in capital to get started. And so it's just one of many examples of how corporate innovation and investment for profit can have a transformative effect on social and environmental issues on our planet. So Mark, you make a very important point here. And I, I hear you say two important things and I, I would just like to go further into it. One is, of course, that it is enterprises which can create tremendous value, solve the problems of the world. But if you really go to certain countries and you will find that corporates are taken as thieves, as agents of exploitation, and the governments can also come with that mindset. And if we come with that mindset, I think what happens is that the ecosystem does not develop for creating the enterprises that are required. So one, how do we really overcome that challenge? Because what you're saying is, and I, I fully agree with you, that yes, corporations can solve. But the second question that does arise is that are all problems solvable by the corporation? There's going to be some challenges for which governments will have to actually uh, take care. And then of course, and there is a third part of the corollary to what you said on Elon Musk. Uh, is there something called as a craziness question? In fact, Elon Musk has always been relegated or been thought of as an absolutely a crazy person or a nut or whatever you might want to say. But one of the most brilliant minds that the world has actually seen in the last 20 years. Yes. Well, I, I think uh, certainly uh, Elon has his... Uh, detriments as well as his benefits. And I'm not saying we should all go out and be Elon Musk, uh, but he does offer an extreme example of the kind of impact companies can have. Uh, but you're right to raise the question of whether all problems can be solved by shared value strategies and by corporations. And the answer is no, uh, of course. Not every problem uh, can be solved by a market-based solution. Uh, there are many programs that are profitably selling products and services to low-income populations, but there has to be some purchasing power on the part of the consumer uh, for a business to be viable. Uh, and so there will always be issues, problems that need to be addressed either by government regulation, because it's something that everybody has to do, and without a law requiring it, people won't do it. Uh, or because there is a customer base that has no purchasing power relative to the solution you're trying to create, and government subsidy is essential. But what I often say is if we can solve the problems that do have market-driven solutions through business and through shared value, we can save the much scarcer resources of government and of civil society to focus in on only those problems that don't have market-driven solutions. And you're also quite right that there are many countries in the world where there is a deeply ingrained suspicion of capitalism and that companies are seen as exploitive, that the success of the company is taking money away from people. Uh, I don't believe, and 
my colleague Michael Porter would agree, that's not how capitalism operates. And that's not how capitalism needs to operate. But it is true that you can make money in a capitalist world in exploitive ways. You can run a business that underpays your workers or has them working in dangerous conditions. You can sell inferior products to people. You can uh, trap people into uh, monopolistic situations where they have no choice about who they buy from and extract uh, rents or excess profits from them. Um, but that's not how most businesses operate. And that's not how I believe you truly get to scale and sustainable success in running a company. So, you know, it's sort of like saying there are people who commit crimes, but that doesn't mean all people are bad or that people are incapable of doing good things. And I would say the same holds true for business. There are businesses that commit crimes, that do bad things, even if they're not criminal, and that make money in ways that extract from society. But shared value says the better solution is to think about a sort of virtuous cycle where the business enterprise you're leading is creating value for society, is leading to better educated, more successful employees, is enabling customers to have a higher quality of life, and is doing it in a sustainable way. And that's the strategy we believe that will lead to long-term commercial success. So, Mark, just a very important point here. When you say there are going to be certain sets of issues that governments will have to resolve, uh, but then of course you need to have a paying capacity for enterprises to enter. But how how would you really make that proposition? How, what is that idea that people should look at to really understand that this is one problem that I should solve or not solve? Or how governments can actually look at this whole idea in terms of saying, this is something that corporations can actually do well and better, and we should not be sure. there in the business. Sure. Well, you know, climate change, one of the great existential threats we face, is probably uh, the most obvious example of that. Um, without putting a price on carbon, which only government can do, uh, businesses will continue to make profit maximizing decisions that ignore climate impact. Uh, and it's perfectly rational for them to do so. Uh, but it is essential that government either regulate or impose a price on carbon for that to be built into the business model of companies in a way that leads them to reduce carbon emissions. Very, very interesting. And then you also said something very important, and I think that's at heart of many things that are happening across the world. Right? When you say like, how is it that you're able to improve the quality of life of people, or what you call as improving ease of living of citizens that you're really talking about? How would we measure that? Because that becomes such an important aspect of how countries can actually run and look at because improvement in quality of life, ease of living, that, that would be such an important peg of measurement because if you are not able to measure it, it can actually be seen as something like a farcical statement. Sure. Well, you know, first, I think for any social or environmental issue, uh, there are measures, whether it is, um, uh, you know, what a living wage constitutes in a given country, whether it is uh, carbon emissions, uh, whether it is uh, the um, standard of living and income of, of people in a region. Uh, so, you know, different businesses affect different social and environmental issues. And for each of the issues that's really material, there are ways to measure progress on that issue. But there are also ways to look more globally at how a society is doing or a country is doing. Uh, and my colleague, Mike Porter, has uh, helped develop uh, something called the Social Progress Index, uh, which is a way of assessing um, about 150 different countries in the world each year 
on how they're doing on key issues of social progress. Um, and that is, I believe, a very powerful way of looking at whether a, a country's population is getting better or worse, and indeed of identifying opportunities for business uh, to make money by helping to solve some of the social problems and meet some of the needs that are not currently being met. Mm -hmm. And so just moving ahead on this, you know, uh, you, you said salaries for people, underpaying of workers, that that has become such a huge point of discussion. Uh, during the times of the pandemic as well, like uh, Yahoo is getting criticized, but there is so much of uh, views on that. And of course, the present administration in the US is also saying that we need to increase the minimum pay. I think. But do you think there is a right model in them saying what should be the pay, what should be the pay gap? Because that can actually have a huge bearing on how things operate. And my, my rebuttal on to that whole thing could be that, oh, are we really stalling innovation? Because somebody who's an entrepreneur, who's a risk taker, uh, don't you think he needs, he deserves to actually get paid better than a lot of other people? Uh, absolutely, he does. And whether there are, and, and it is essential to, to the idea of capitalism, that people who are creating powerful new solutions that make a difference in the world can make a lot of money. Uh, whether there should be some limitations on how much money uh, is a separate question. And, and I think that's not an issue for shared value as much as it is a societal or ethical consideration. Um, but I, I think, uh, well, uh, I'll leave it at that. What I will say is that there's an increasing evidence that paying workers well and giving them jobs that have some degree of personal satisfaction and autonomy in their operation and decision making leads to higher productivity and greater profitability. So that uh, Walmart, for example, the large global uh, store chain, one of the largest companies in the world, uh, has consistently over the last several years raised entry level wages and created entry. greater opportunities for advancement. And when they first did this, their stock went down by a third in value. But what they demonstrated is that paying workers more increased productivity because the workers are not stressed out when they come to work about all of the financial burdens they face and the fact that they can't take care of their family and are trying to work two or three different jobs and so on. And it makes sense that if you pay people well and give them a, a comfortable working environment, uh, you get the results back in greater productivity and greater profitability. And so this whole idea, uh, you know, it's a little bit like uh, other social environmental issues. The idea was, you know, the less you pay the worker, the more money you get to keep. Or the, the more you ignore your environmental footprint and impact, the more money you get to keep and the more profit you can be. But the reality is that's wrong. That might work in the short run. But ultimately, creating this virtuous cycle where you as a company are enabling your workers to live well, enabling your, your customers to live well and safely, uh, operating in an environmentally sound way. Uh, these are the companies that are most profitable and most successful over time. So, Mark, you know, like, uh, as you would really see that creating shared value is an idea is at the heart of redefining capitalism in many, many ways. I, I see it as a redefining tool because what you're really saying is, oh, we, we have to really look at unmet needs. We have to solve the problems. We have to take care of environment uh, and so many other things that you actually say along with it. So in the times of the pandemic, with the last 12 months have actually been one of the most brutal times the world has actually seen. And how do you think corporates can actually look at shared value as one of the most important constructs to really move forward so that we, even if we face such a kind of crisis, which is going to happen in 10 years, 20 years, or maybe 50 years, but we need to be ready with certain principles that we need to follow. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think it's, it's very clear that uh, the pandemic and other social problems can only be solved when companies, government, 
and the civil society work together. Uh, you know, if it were not for companies inventing the vaccine, if it were not for companies creating protective gear, uh, if it were not for for-profit hospitals and, and healthcare centers that are operating around the world, uh, we would not be able to tackle the pandemic. But at the same time, without massive government subsidy to support businesses and to pay for the development of the vaccine and the protective gear and so on from government, uh, businesses would not have been able to create or sell or afford to invest in these products. And at the same time, there are whole uh, huge segments of society that cannot afford to pay for the vaccine, that cannot afford to pay for protective gear. And without civil society to help distribute goods to them, uh, to help them through this period of unemployment that so many people are suffering through, uh, enable them to continue to buy food and other necessities, um, we couldn't have a solution either. So, uh, you know, increasingly we see in every major social problem that the three sectors need to work together and collaborate. And that generally does not happen. But I think the pandemic is a very interesting example, painful though it may be, of the way in which all three sectors are essential to contributing to solutions to the world's problem. So Mark, you know, like when you talk about this whole movement and then like how things are really getting solved and how, how challenges are actually being uh, managed, uh, there are larger societal issues that we've actually seen emerge uh, during the times of the pandemic, like of course, uh, I don't think pandemic had to be uh, having an impact on that, but it was like the Black Lives Matter movement and everything. Uh, and where do you think the role of operations actually gets there? And how do you really think shared values and ideas can really help us resolve uh, those sets of issues? Sure. You know, the issue of, of race is a particularly painful one in the United States right now. But of course, in every region of the world, there are uh, populations that are disadvantaged, where there are prejudices that hold them back from economic success or social success. And uh, so it is a universal issue. Uh, one of the research reports we did uh, was provocatively called the competitive advantage of racial equity, because we saw that the kind of systemic and structural racism that is so deeply embedded in our society limits the ability of business to succeed. Uh, a simple example, um, about 20% uh, of the world's population and about 10% of the US population is unbanked or underbanked. So they don't really have access to financial services, to credit, to savings accounts, et cetera. And the result is uh, much harder to get out of poverty if you can't access credit, if you can't access savings, and so on. Uh, and so we've seen lots of innovation around what's being called fintech, uh, you know, technological solutions that enable people to do mobile banking on their cell phones and so on that have opened up a huge market. Again, in the US, it's estimated to be a $140 billion market of people who are unbanked or underbanked. They often have to take out what's called payday loans at exorbitant rates of interest that can be 30, 40, 50, 60% a year. And uh, there is a huge opportunity for more traditional banking institutions or technology-driven banks that can operate with much lower interest rates to provide people with access to credit and savings. Um, so there, there are many examples where um, there are opportunities for companies to innovate, uh, to address unmet needs, uh, and do so in a very profitable way that also makes customers better off than the solutions there are today. And I would just like to step back to one of the points that you had actually said about uh, how vaccine has really got developed and things, and uh, of course the protective equipment. You know, like there has always been the severe criticism of pharmaceutical companies, at least in the developing world, uh, of saying, oh, they have they can be exploitative and they're supercharged. 
but I think at, at this time of the pandemic, they have really reversed their image to the best possible extent. I think they've done a phenomenal job of pricing the vaccine in the way it has been priced. At least in India, I can tell you, of course, there are governmental interventions, but it is getting priced at less than $3 for a dose, uh, and which, which is a phenomenal exercise in terms of uh, doing away with that mindset of exploitation to really coming to solving a problem. Uh, so would you agree with that uh, point of view, or do you think something more has actually happened? No, I, I, I would agree with that point of view. I, I, I think I wish there were, I certainly don't wish for more pandemics, but I wish there were more examples when it was so clear to companies that doing something that was in society's interest is also in their own economic interest. Um, but that's certainly what we've seen with the vaccines. Uh, and I believe is true in, in many other areas as well, though not quite as obvious. Um, so yeah, I, I think in that sense, there have been some important lessons uh, that come out of this unfortunate experience. So um, Mark, what you've said is that the central idea, as I really see you, see you saying it, is that it is about bringing economic objectives and social objectives together. And that that's where that sweet point of the capitalistic model is. And when, when you were talking about issues of say racial equity, employees or whatever, that, that is what we are really trying to bring together. Uh, and, do That's think, right. and do you think that will be the manifesto for all of future or how do you think this idea can actually evolve over a period of time? Yes, I mean, I, and I, I think the world is moving that way. You know, not everybody is using the language that uh, Professor Porter and I came up with around creating shared value. Uh, but there are many companies that have begun to add a social or environmental dimension to their competitive strategy to their dip source of differentiation from others in their industry and are doing so successfully. Some of them call it blended value, some of them call it mutual benefit, some of them, there, there are many different terms out there, but they all get to the idea that running a business in a way that makes the world better actually leads to a more profitable business over the long run. And, uh, and of course, there are also companies out there that are using the shared value language that aren't actually doing shared value. So we know that this idea continues to gain acceptance around the world, that it is very much the direction that the world is moving. Uh, again, not everyone uses the same terminology, but we have seen business move in this direction. And business is increasingly expected to do so. Uh, you know, Edelman, the public relations firm, does a global survey every year around levels of trust. And what they found, particularly this year, is that trust in corporations is actually higher than trust in government or trust in civil society. And that people today do expect companies to be contributing to solutions to social problems through the way they operate their business. And it really has become, I believe, unavoidable for companies to have to acknowledge and address the social and environmental issues that are certainly those that are core to their business, but even more broadly, those that affect the societies in which they operate, things like racial equity. So, Mark, you have spent so many years, and it's been 10 years since this journey started. Um, what do you think was your biggest challenge in this journey as you were going along to really make that difference, bring that change in ideology, ideas, and things? like What, what was the biggest challenge in, that you felt? I, again, I, I think the biggest challenge is this mindset that if you're serious about making money, you should ignore social and environmental consequences or the well-being of your customers and workers. Um, and uh, that, um, that you know, if you want to do good, you, you can't be serious about making money. If you want to make money, you can't be serious about doing good as well. Uh, and that's just plain wrong. There are so many counterexamples. Uh, and yet that thinking persists. And again, it is uh, unfortunately reinforced by the handful of bad actors out there 
who do run their business in very extractive ways. And I, I think private equity companies that particularly those that, that, that buy up businesses with tremendous amounts of debt and then often sell off the assets and put the businesses, the companies out of business and create massive unemployment, you know, are a classic example of a harmful way to make money. Uh, and so these counter examples that are out there and that get a lot of attention and cause a lot of hardship in the world um, are one of the obstacles. Uh, because people come to believe that's the only way you can be successful. And of, of course, it's not. And of course, those enterprises are ultimately self-defeating. But, uh, but again, in the short run, they appear to be successful. Uh, and people often reject the idea of creating shared value by holding up companies that are acting badly and suggesting that that's the way capitalism has to be. You know, capitalism has many different flavors. It is different, as we know, in the Scandinavian countries. It's different in India and Asia. It's different in the United States. It's different in Latin America. Some of those versions of capitalism are much healthier than others. And I would not suggest that the United States is one of the healthiest versions of capitalism anymore. I, I, I think we have, partly because of activist investors and short-termism and the extraordinary compensation of CEOs and, and other factors, we have moved to a point where a lot of what is happening and encouraged and permitted in the U.S. in capitalism is actually a destructive version of capitalism rather a shared, than a shared value or constructive version. But there are constructive versions, and I think those are ultimately where we want to get to as a society. Mark, I have to ask you this question. You, you invoke this whole idea of the U.S. and the U.S. is not following the right model of capitalism or that there is some destructive elements to it. And that whole idea possibly has caused or created a lot of caustic politics uh, within the U.S. as well. So I think economics and politics eventually will move hand in hand. Uh, so there could be huge challenges to that. Uh, where do you think? U.S. went wrong in this whole capitalistic model. What do you think needs to be changed? Because, it, you know, like the epitome of the right way of looking at democracy, the capitalistic model, U.S. has been a leader of the world in many, many ways. We have to accept sure. it. Uh, so we have to really say, so what is it that we can learn from the experiences of the U.S. so that people don't really make that mistake again uh, and really move forward in the right direction? Yes. Well, I, I think... Uh... A lot of it uh, has been driven, unfortunately, by a very short-term perspective uh, by investors. And there certainly are some movements to think about how to refocus capitalism on the long term. And there certainly are uh, tax policies and other things that can be implemented that would reduce the benefit of short-term profit-seeking and encourage longer term investment. But I think the, the short term perspective of investors and the role of activist hedge funds uh, has been part of what has been so destructive in the United States. Um, I think the CEO compensation model, which uh, you know really changed dramatically about 30 or 40 years ago, to be focused on uh, stock options rather than just salary, combined with the fact that the tenure of major CEOs has gotten shorter, so that the typical CEO tenure is now four or five years. Uh, so you come in as CEO, you have four or five years, and you find that your ability to make a fortune depends on driving the stock price up for those four or five years and nothing else. And it has created an overwhelming incentive for CEOs to focus on short term, to do things like distribute uh, funds by buying back their shares rather than investing the money in new enterprises and growth and creating new jobs and innovation. Uh, it's created all kinds of destructive tendencies that, again, enable people to make money in the short run 
despite longer term negative consequences. Uh, and it has also led to a real crony capitalism that we particularly saw under the last administration, but has been a growing fact of life in the United States through many administrations, whereby uh, you know, lobbying government to pass laws or make purchasing decisions that favor your company's short-term current operating model um, is uh, encouraged and is enabled in in uh, in the U.S. today, uh, so that you know Exxon Mobil uh, can spend a decade or two uh, trying to prevent legislation that would uh, impose a tax on carbon, and they can do that successfully to keep their quarterly earnings going. Despite the fact that in, in, in trying to preserve that outdated business model, they've actually lost out hugely. Uh, you know, ExxonMobil has been successful in holding off legislation, but they're worth a third of what they were worth as a company 10 years ago, because the world is changing and they're trying to hold back the change. But they've been able to hold back the change with the US government quite successfully. Uh, but at the end of the day, what it has meant is that they simply are now out of step with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And just just moving ahead on to this, you know, like you recently wrote a piece on uh, where ESG fails. Uh, it has been such a, a huge, uh, what is all ESG as an idea has really caught on with a lot of people and things like. What what, what was the central idea that you were really trying to push forward uh, from yeah. that whole thing? So, you know, ESG thinking really comes out of a social movement that is not focused on whether companies are successful or not, but is really focused on holding companies accountable for the negative impacts they have. And there are a couple problems with it. The first is there's no connection between the ESG ratings and the economic or competitive success of companies. And so it's, it, they're being looked at in a vacuum, independent of whether the company is succeeding or failing. Uh, the second problem with ESG ratings is they've become a checklist of all of the different social and environmental impacts that companies have, scores of them. And yet for any given company, most of those issues are not material to the economic success of the company. And they're also not the ones where the company has the biggest impact on the world. So you can talk about the carbon footprint of a bank and you can rate banks based on their greenhouse gas emissions, but carbon footprint is not a material success factor for the profitability of a bank. And it is also not the biggest impact that banks have on the planet. Instead, if you look at something like subprime lending where banks are making loans to people who can't afford to pay them back, and charging excessive interest rates, that's a much more material social issue for banking, uh, but it was often overlooked by ESG ratings. And so when you then look from the investor perspective and say, well, if I invest in companies that do better on ESG ratings, will I make more money? The answer is probably not, because those ratings just are not related to the economic success of the company. What we've tried to do with creating shared value is to say there are, for any given industry, issues that are material to the success of companies in that industry. And in fact, what we've seen is that sustainability practices in an industry tend to converge over time. Everybody ends up sort of doing the same thing. You know, if you're a logistics company, you try and reduce your carbon footprint by reducing the number of miles that you have to ship things and so on. Um, well, that doesn't create a competitive advantage. Professor Porter would say that's about operational effectiveness and it's about best practice in the industry. And sooner or later, everybody in the industry is going to adopt best practice. And so you won't have a long-term competitive advantage by just doing what everybody else does. But shared value says there are ways to do things differently than others in the industry that create a greater positive impact or less negative impact and that also differentiate your company in ways that can make you more successful. And so the shared value lens on investing, 
is to look for the companies that are creating positive social impact as a core part of their differentiation and strategic positioning. And that turns out to be a very different analysis than the typical ESG rating is. And so while it's wonderful to see so many people around the world beginning to care about environmental, social, and governance aspects of business, the reality is the existing ESG rating systems simply don't work either to identify the companies that are having the best social environmental impact or to identify the companies where you can make the most money as an investor. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, like Rich, uh, Mark, you, you've also created some very interesting idea on hybrid metrics. So I think this is where you're, you're trying to solve this challenge and moving it forward. Uh, am I right in saying that? Yes, and it, it's really just an idea and a new one, and we haven't really uh, done the research to prove it out. Uh, but, you know, it, it's interesting how this idea came about. Uh, we were working with a very large uh, Italian uh, utility, electric company, ML, operates actually in 35 countries all over the world. Uh, and they have made a commitment to moving toward renewables. They are about a 70 billion euro company, so quite a large company. And they're already more than 50% renewable energy. They're, they're quite unusual in the uh, renewable, in the uh, utility industry globally. And they know that their renewable energy is actually more profitable than the fossil fuel powered power plants that they are still operating in Italy and a few other countries around the world. So as they move toward renewable energy, their profit margin, gross profit margin, actually increases. What's fascinating is they never said that to their investors because the sustainability folks were very focused on meeting their targets around renewables, on talking about how they were advancing the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, on doing their sustainability report, the investors were very focused on sort of quarter by quarter earnings. And the two teams within the company, sustainability and investor relations, never really spoke to each other. And so we realized there's a, there's a, a fundamental point missing here when even companies that are doing good things that we improve investor returns aren't telling it to investors because they're so disjointed. And so the solution we proposed is to say, look, instead of measuring ESG over here and profit over there, let's pick one or two things that are central to your business model and create what we call the hybrid metric that brings together the, the social environmental and the financial result together. So for the utility, we're able to look at the carbon intensity of their profits, the CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour divided by their EBITDA. And we can compare that metric across different companies in the industry. And so we can begin to see not just who is doing the best job environmentally or who is the most profitable, but who is decarbonizing most profitable. And that, as an investor, is what I really want to know. And so the idea is, can we look industry by industry and find these hybrid metrics? So in healthcare, it might be the uh, quality of life or the daily adjusted life years relative to the profit of a healthcare company. Uh, in life insurance, it might be you know, the, the uh, life expectancy relative to the profitability. Different industries will have different metrics. But what we really need to do, and this does go to the essence of creating shared value, is bring together social, environmental, and financial performance into a single metric that enables us to assess them together. And of course, this only works where there is a true interdependency, where there is a causal relationship. We know there's a causal relationship as to why renewable energy is more profitable for this Italian utility. And so we can create this hybrid metric knowing that it has some meaning because it makes sense. There's a causal relationship. Uh, and of course, the problem with so many ESG metrics 
is there is no causal relationship between the particular metric and the profitability of the company. So we need to begin to think about that connection, and that's what this hybrid metrics idea is trying to work for. So when you talk about hybrid metric, uh, Mark, uh, I would rather see that how can we make it as a standard uh, within the corporations or within the world, probably even have some kind of a, uh, what I call a stock market index, like the, uh, what, what would you call as a uh, NASDAQ or whatever. And can, can we actually look at that kind of thing? Would you aspire for that, want to look at it or? Yes, absolutely. We are, we are trying to launch a, a, a larger research project that we're calling the Economics of Impact because we, we've realized that this isn't just a matter of investors identifying companies that are you know, doing good things for the world more profitably, uh, but internal management teams don't have decision-making frameworks that enable them to build social and environmental impact into their decisions when they're deciding about capital allocation or investment. And, you know, there's so many companies out there that have made commitments about decarbonizing by 2030, 2040, 2050, or other social and environmental goals that they've committed to over a period of decades. And unfortunately, um, I work with a group called the World Benchmarking Alliance, which was set up by the United uh, Nations Foundation to track uh, the impact of corporations on the sustainable development goals. And they're looking industry by industry at a couple thousand companies around the world from all different uh, countries, uh, north and south, uh, to track industry by industry whether companies are actually on track to achieve their goals. And what we're finding in almost every industry is that virtually no companies are actually on track to achieve their goals. And when you do this economics of impact analysis, you find that the business model of the company and the projections that they're showing for their business are not consistent with their claims about getting to carbon neutrality or some other social or environmental goal. That they just are operating in two separate dimensions and you can't deliver on the business projection and also achieve the stated goal. So it's tremendously important, again, that we bring together the social and environmental with the financial to have some framework that says that those goals are connected and, in fact, aligned. And it's just not the case for most businesses today. And what I hear you say, Mark, is that you, one of your very important ideas that you have talked about uh, in the last few years with Mike Porter is the idea of purpose. And where, where do you think uh, shared value, purpose, hybrid metric? Uh, I, I see that there is a whole huge interconnection that actually exists, but how, how do you really see this interconnection develop over a period of time? Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I agree. There's a lot of talk about companies needing a social purpose today. Major institutions like BlackRock have, have said that it's important. Um, and adopting a social purpose can indeed be a very powerful way to achieve a positive competitive positioning and a positive social impact. Uh, and so, for example, I just finished writing a case on PayPal, uh, the electronic payments company. And they have taken a social purpose of democratizing access to financial services because they believe they can give people access to credit and savings and other financial services at 80% less cost than traditional banks. And the best market for them to serve is low-income populations around the world that need access to financial services at these low prices. And so that has become the competitive positioning and vision for the company. It has differentiated them from others in the fintech industry. And it has led them to some tremendously successful innovations. There's a particular project called PayPal Working Capital that is designed to make it very easy for small businesses to borrow modest amounts of money for working capital that they could never have access to through traditional bank lending. And this has now been a $14 billion product for PayPal, quite successful, 
very profitable, but has also helped hundreds of thousands of businesses grow much more rapidly than their peers because of access to the capital. So it, it's a great example, uh, I believe, of how a corporate purpose can lead to innovation that creates new economic opportunity, new business models that generate positive social impact. Um, but of course, not every company that adopts a purpose is really building it into its strategy and operations. I would say the vast majority of companies have hired a public relations firm to come up with a corporate social purpose that sounds wonderful and looks great on their website and that has absolutely nothing to do with how they operate their business. In those cases, purpose is utterly meaningless and inconsequential. But for the companies that have really committed to achieving a social purpose as core to their strategy and business model, it is a truly powerful competitive advantage. But Mark, you, you know, like uh, we have been talking about enterprises and this whole idea of purpose becomes so important at that level. How do you think this whole idea of shared value, purpose, hybrid metric can actually be applied to individuals, if I may ask? Because I think, yeah. that, because at the end of the day, it has to be like how individuals feel within the system of corporations working there and probably see that whether they're contributing towards shared value, purpose or not. Yes. You know, the course I teach at Harvard Business School is now called Purpose and Profit. And in addition to talking about purpose-driven companies like PayPal, I also ask people to think about their own purpose in life. And the reason that this occurred to me is because we were fortunate to have the CEOs and founders of many of the companies that we write cases about actually come to the classroom at Harvard and talk to the students about their experience. And what I observed is that for these corporate leaders, there was a deep sense of personal purpose behind the company's strategy. And that it was a great source of fulfillment for them in their lives. But it also was part of what led them to take a different path to innovate to find opportunities for economic success through their companies that other people miss. And so we began to talk with the students about the importance of thinking intentionally about your own purpose in life and how this idea of creating shared value that we apply to companies can also apply to individuals. We want our students to be economically successful to become powerful leaders in society. But we also want them to do it in a way that leads to a better society for all. And that will only happen if people begin to think about their own purpose in life, not just in terms of the dollars in their bank account, but in terms of what they are able to accomplish to help others live better lives. And Mark, you, you know, like, this is important, but if I really want to go ahead and ask you one or two final questions, like one would be, if I ask you to really say as to what has been your impact, what, what do you, how do you really see yourself in this middle of this very important journey uh, that you have actually been on for the last uh, couple of decades? Yeah, well, it's certainly been a journey of learning for me. And the things I believe today are not things uh, that I would have said 20 years ago. So there's been a great deal of learning. And, and frankly, it's, it's been learning from some remarkable business leaders and academic leaders around the world, people such as yourself, I mean, who have put these ideas into practice, who have embellished and deepened these ideas. Uh, and it has just been a great privilege for me uh, to be able to learn uh, and study. Uh, such exceptional people. Um, so, you know, I, the, the question of how positive social change can happen in the world is a deeply puzzling enigma. There are no simple answers. It's great to give money to charity through philanthropy, and that helps people. 
it's great to run a business in a way that creates positive impact for the world and that helps people. But the reason that there is so much suffering and environmental damage in the world is not reducible to a simple equation. And there's no one approach that's going to solve these complex problems and change the planet. Uh, it takes many different approaches and it's really a complicated issue. And so for me, it has been uh, a couple decades of trying to understand just a little bit more about how social progress happens in the world uh, and what I can do to contribute in a small way to that. Uh, and it's been a great privilege to be on that journey, uh, but I'll certainly be the first to admit I have a long way to go. But can I hazard saying that you, you are playing a part, even though it might just be a small part, like a lot of many other people or whatever, in terms of survival of the planet and survival of the human race in many, many ways. Now, would you accept that point or you would want to differ on that? A very small part, but yes, I will accept it and I am grateful for it, I mean, thank you. Yes, and sure. of course, you sure. are as well, you are thank as well. Thank you, Mark. But this has just been a very fascinating interaction. I think I just learned so much today by having this interaction. Mark, thanks a lot for joining us today for the Thinkers Dialogue. It's been an honor for us to have you with us and look forward to further conversations as uh, times go by. And of course, looking at meeting you in person once this whole pandemic is over. Be well, be safe, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. It is always a pleasure to see you again. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all the wonderful work you do and are leading in India and, and throughout the world. So it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be well. Thank you.